The following program is brought to you by the Center for Educational Outreach at Baylor College of Medicine. Hello, I'm Dr. Charles Seisler. I'm a professor of sleep medicine at the Harvard Medical School and chief of the divisions of sleep medicine at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and the Harvard Medical School. And I'm here to talk with you today about sleep and daily rhythms. The sleep-wake cycle is divided between the waking day when a variety of regions of the brain support our ability to sustain wakefulness and to maintain our concentration and to do our best, and the nighttime in which we ordinarily sleep at a regular basis. And there are other neurobiological systems in the brain that switch from the waking state to the sleeping state in order to allow us to maintain a consolidated bout of sleep during the nighttime. There is a region of the brain that is where our internal clock is located that governs the timing of these daily oscillations. And that internal clock has input from each of the eyes that convey light-dark information from the outside world to keep our internal clock in sync with the Earth's 24-hour day. Now, when we try to upset the apple cart by, for example, launching a space shuttle at night when the astronauts have to be most alert during the nighttime hours, there are a number of different factors that have to be considered to make sure that the crew members will be able to function at their best when they're doing a night launch like this. And one of those factors is what time of day it is in the body. And that's perhaps one of the most challenging factors because we have daily rhythms of a variety of different physiologic, behavioral, thermoregulatory, and other functions in the body that cycle between the daytime and the nighttime. For example, our body temperature is normally higher during the daytime than it is at night. And that might seem normal because we're more physically active during the daytime than we are during the nighttime. And so one might expect that the body would be cooler at night than it is during the day when we're using our muscles. But even if we maintain someone continuously throughout day and night in bed so that they're not exercising at all and we keep them continuously awake, the body temperature still cycles so that it's higher during the daytime and lower at night. Similarly, the various hormonal systems in the body vary between one time of day and the other. For example, in children who are developing, they release growth hormone during the nighttime hours, and that allows them to grow. And children whose sleep is very disturbed by their environment may suffer from an inability to grow because of disturbance of the release of that hormone. Other hormones, such as the timing of the so-called stress hormone cortisol, also vary between the daytime and the nighttime, reaching its peak just before we wake up in the morning in anticipation of the beginning of our day and falling to its lowest level just before we go to bed at night. Every hormone has a different fingerprint of how it is secreted. So the hormone melatonin, the so-called hormone of darkness, is normally begins to be released an hour or so before we go to bed at night, is at high levels throughout the nighttime while we're asleep, and then drops down to lower levels within an hour or so of our waking up in the morning. But ironically, if you stay continuously awake all night, the time that you'll be most sleepy is just before your habitual wake time. The time that you're likely to be least sleepy is just before the time that you ordinarily go to sleep. And that puzzled scientists for many years. But it seems that this internal clock that governs the timing of sleeping and waking opposes what would otherwise be the process that governs our whether or not we have satisfied our need for sleep. So during the normal 16-hour waking day, the drive for sleep is increasing with each passing hour, and we might get very tired in the latter part of the day if it weren't for the fact that the internal clock that drives the timing of all these hormones and these other physiological rhythms begins to give us a second wind in the latter half of the day. And uh, for many young people, that second wind is so strong that they might begin to start going to bed later and later as they, as, they, uh, as they begin to develop into adolescence and into adults. 
So it's, it's not uncommon for adolescents to have difficulty falling asleep at night, and that may be because the drive from this internal clock is so strong uh, that, they, that, they, that it overcomes the increasing need for sleep because they've been awake for 16 consecutive hours. Once we do get to sleep, then we dissipate the need for sleep based on this increasing amount of wakefulness, this 16 hours of wakefulness that we've had during the day. We dissipate that need for sleep, the most intense need for sleep, in the first few hours of sleep. But then that internal clock, in order to consolidate our sleep within the 24-hour day, sends out a stronger and stronger drive for sleep in the latter half of our usual sleep episode. And that enables us to glue together the first and the second half of sleep. The second half of sleep is a particularly important part of sleep because that's when we have the richest content of rapid eye movement sleep, the sleep stage that's associated with vivid dreaming. Uh, and that's a time when we're asleep that we can often solve a lot of problems that we may not have been able to figure out during the daytime. One of the consequences of these daily variations in alertness and performance is that the risk of accidents also varies with the time of day. So if we look at these data that were gathered from the National Transportation Safety Board on single vehicle truck accidents, you see that they peak not when it gets dark at 10 or 11 o'clock at night, not when the bars close, maybe a little later, but actually just before dawn at that same time, which is a critical zone of vulnerability for most people who stay awake at night. It's in, it's in the latter half of the night when the drive for sleep emanating from our internal daily clock, that circadian pacemaker, is the strongest. And for many people who are working at night and who have been awake the prior day, the need for sleep based on how many hours that they've been awake is also the strongest. So both of those two drives are sending out the strongest propensity for sleep. And that's when, if we're trying to stay awake by driving a vehicle, we're at greatest risk of nodding off, falling asleep, and injuring ourselves. It's not just performance that varies with the time of day, but also the very ability for us to get the restorative sleep that we need. Many of us have experienced uh, the frustrating phenomenon when we're very, very tired and maybe have stayed awake all night and we attempt to sleep during the day, uh, that it's, it's tough to try to sleep during the daytime. And that's because the internal clock is sending out a signal, basically an alarm clock, that is trying to keep the brain awake during the daytime. So ironically, the time that it's often most difficult for us to fall asleep is our usual bedtime. And that's why many adolescents might think that they don't feel a tremendously strong drive to sleep, stay up a little later, keep the lights on a little later, reset their internal clocks a little later, and it, be, it sort of snowballs and begins to become more and more difficult uh, to go to bed at a, at a sufficiently early hour to get a full night of sleep before going to school. Light is the principal synchronizer for our internal biological clock, the timing of our exposure to the light-dark cycle. And this diagram shows how light exposure at different times of day affects or resets our internal biological clock. And as you can see, light exposure in the evening hours from about 5 p.m. until our habitual bedtime, which in this illustration is shown to be at about midnight, light exposure during that time interval resets our internal clock to a later hour, delaying our circadian rhythms so that the next day it's harder for us to go to sleep at the time that we did the day before. Because all of those systems that are controlled by this internal clock, the timing of the release of all those hormones, the timing of the body temperature cycle, the timing of daily cycles of performance and alertness, all shift to a later hour if we're exposed to light in the evening hours. Morning exposure to light, on the other hand, resets our circadian system to an earlier hour. So therefore, if we're out outside in the morning time, if we walk to work, if we walk to school, that exposure to light in the morning will help keep our internal clock synchronized to the 24-hour day and make it easier for us to get up in the morning so that we can 
take care of those obligations and maintain a regular schedule. On the other hand, if we keep the shades drawn in our room in the morning, in our bedrooms in the morning, then it'll become more difficult for us to get up in the morning because we're not getting that signal to our internal clock that's resetting us and keeping us in sync with the 24-hour day. The intensity of light is an important variable that determines how effective it is in resetting our internal clock. So exposure to the light of a single candle will have much less resetting effect on, on, the, on the, this internal clock in the brain than exposure to bright light. So outdoor light, sunlight, uh, is the equivalent on most days, if it's a cloudy day, to about 8,000 candles of light held about a meter away from you. So the outdoor light is much, much brighter than ordinary indoor light. Ordinary indoor light is about 1 to 200 lux if, it's, if you're in a well-lit room. And you can see that ordinary indoor light, artificial light, has about 50% of the resetting effect as natural outdoor intensities of light that are comparable to natural outdoor light uh, just after dawn or just before dusk. So the artificial light is having a remarkably strong resetting effect on this internal clock. Now we don't think of light ordinarily as a drug, but when we are exposed to light between dusk when it's dark outside and the time that we normally go to bed at night, all of that light exposure is resetting our internal clock to a later hour and making it more difficult for us to go to sleep. In fact, when we go into the bathroom, if we have those lights around the mirrors that, that, um, that often, if we have those lights around the mirrors that, that, that bathe our entire face and our eyes in light just before we go to bed at night, that light exposure is suppressing the release of the sleep facilitating hormone melatonin and resetting our internal clock to a later hour, which will make it more difficult for us, not only that day, but the next day, uh, to go to sleep. We can, of course, take advantage of that property of light, and the astronauts do this, to reset their circadian rhythms before a launch. In fact, that's how they prepare for a night launch. They're exposed to bright artificial light at night during the time that they anticipate that they will be launching the space shuttle. And that exposure to light at night resets their internal clock so that they can sleep well during the day, so that the release of the sleep-promoting hormone melatonin occurs during the day instead of during the night, and so that they're able to adjust to being just as alert during the nighttime hours as they ordinarily would be during the daytime hours. And that will reduce their risk of making a sleep-related error or having a sleep-related accident during the critical launching of the shuttle. One of the things that, that we are looking at in order to try to develop new technologies to make it even easier to reset the, uh, the internal clocks of the astronauts is what wavelength of light is most important for resetting this internal biological clock. It turns out that just like the ear has two functions, and one is hearing and the other is balance, the eye has two functions. One is conscious vision that we can read and, and see each other with, and the other is this circad what's called circadian photoreception, which is responsible for resetting our internal biological clock. A small subset of the ganglion cells in the retina that normally mediate conscious vision, a small set of those, subset of those are intrinsically photoreceptive and directly receive those photons of light and send a, on a hotline a signal to that internal clock in the brain that tells the brain whether it's daytime or it's nighttime. These are sluggishly responding cells that don't immediately respond to light the way our conscious visual system do, does. It takes time for these cells to turn on and begin to increase their firing, and it also takes a long time, by neurophysiological standards, for these cells to shut off and stop firing once the lights are turned off and the eyes are in darkness. These specialized ganglion cells in the retina respond to different wavelengths of light most efficiently as compared to our conscious vision. So, our, so light that is about 555 nanometers 
in terms of its wavelength is most efficient for our conscious vision and we would ordinarily be most sensitive to that type of light, to that color of light. It would have a green color. Whereas we are not nearly as sensitive to more bluish light that has a wavelength around 460 nanometers. But as you can see from this diagram, the resetting effect of blue light is much stronger, twice as great, as green light. So we now know that photon per photon, looking up at the blue sky, has twice the resetting effect as looking down at the green grass, even if we're exposed to the same number of photons of those different colors of light. And we're beginning to try to develop technologies that will help NASA astronauts and even ground controllers remain synchronized with their schedules by exposing them to different wavelengths of light. That's going to be especially important in the year 2020 when we begin sending astronauts to the moon because they're going to be exploring regions of the moon that have very peculiar light-dark cycles. First of all, the day length on the moon is very different than it is here on Earth. Instead of being 24 hours long, it's over 700 hours long. There's about two weeks of light on the moon and two weeks of darkness on the moon for every lunar day. Moreover, there are some regions of the lunar surface which are of particular interest for NASA scientists in terms of deciding where we would set up a base station that are continuously bathed in light, the so-called peaks of eternal light. There are also places on the moon that are of great interest to scientists that for billions of years have never had even a single photon of light shine upon them. And there may even be ice in those very cold regions of the moon. So the astronauts may be exploring regions of the moon where it's either continuously light or the day length is a month long instead of 24 hours long. And we need to develop procedures and methods and technologies to help them keep their Earth-based internal clock in sync so that they can sleep every roughly 24 hours as they do on Earth and be alert and awake when they need to be exploring rather than suffering from sleep deprivation that is due to a phenomenon kind of like jet lag where they'd be out of sync with their environment. One of the other properties of this internal clock that differs between people is that some of us have an internal clock that runs a little faster than others. We're all tightly clustered near 24 hours, but not exactly 24 hours. So some people have an internal clock that has a cycle length that's almost 24 and a half hours or even longer than that. And some of us have an internal clock and some of us have a cycle length of our internal clock that's shorter than 24 hours, maybe even 23 and a half hours. What is the consequence of that? Well, we're all synchronized by the light dark cycle to a 24 hour day. So you shouldn't think that you have an internal clock that is constantly running out of sync with the 24-hour day, although that does happen in very rare circumstances. But for the vast majority of us, our internal clock is reset every day to accommodate the difference between its intrinsic period, which may be, let's say, 24 and a quarter hours, and the day length here on Earth of 24 hours. So most people, on average, would have to reset their internal clock by about 15 minutes every day. But some people have to reset it by a half an hour or more in one direction or another. And the difference between those people is the difference between morning types and evening types. So people with an internal clock that runs a little bit faster, that have a shorter than 24 hour day, they get to the same point a little earlier each day. And their internal clock is constantly struggling, resetting itself to lengthen that internal day. And the consequence of that is that people who have a shorter than 24-hour intrinsic period of their internal clock, they will tend to wake up earlier. They'll tend to be tired more earlier in the evening. Whereas those whose internal clock is longer than 24 hours, particularly around 24 and a half hours, they're going to be the evening types. They'll, they'll be raring to go in the evening hours, not really wanting to go to bed, and, ha and struggling to wake up in the morning. Ironically, those evening types are actually getting up at an earlier biological time of day than the morning types. It just happens to be a later clock hour. The second important factor that determines how alert we are, 
how well we'll be able to perform, and the our ability to sleep as well is at the number of hours that we've been awake beforehand. So if you try to go to sleep an hour or two after you've just woken up, it's going to be tough to fall asleep. On the other hand, if you are awake for 20, 30, 40 consecutive hours, the drive for sleep is going to be so strong that it's going to be hard to resist sleep. One of the things that happens if we go without sleep is that when we go for an extended duration of time without sleep, we begin to build up deficits. And in fact, being awake for 24 consecutive hours impairs our reaction time performance by an amount that's comparable to being legally drunk. It's as if you had just taken three shots of whiskey in the prior hour in terms of the impairment of your performance. And that's why it's so dangerous to drive when we haven't slept enough. In fact, if you haven't slept enough, a single beer can be the equivalent of a six-pack because the two factors, alcohol and sleep deprivation, interact in quite an adverse way on your ability to sustain your alertness and maintain your performance. The third important factor is whether or not you've gotten an adequate amount of sleep on a regular basis. You may not have stayed awake for 30 consecutive hours, but if you've only gotten four or five hours of sleep a night for the prior week, your performance will be just as impaired as if you've stayed awake for 24 hours. We live in a society that is, in many industrialized countries in the world, is burning the candle at both ends. You can see in this special photography that, that has been done from outer space by NASA scientists, you can see the hot spots all over the industrialized areas of the world where even during the nighttime hours, from outer space, you can see the, the lights lighting up the skies. Uh, and as a result of this upsetting of the apple cart, as a result of the fact that, that people have the lights on during the nighttime uh, and are keeping the shades down during the daytime, the prevalence, for example, of delayed sleep phase syndrome, which is an inability to fall asleep at night and difficulty waking up during the at an appropriate time during the daytime that is so great that it becomes a clinical impairment. That's very common, particularly among adolescents and other young people. There are more than 20 million shift workers in the United States who have a variable work schedule that varies between day work and night work. And we, we all depend on one crutch or another in order to help us deal with this disturbance of our sleep-wake cycle, this chaos of our internal timing. One of, we have another 60 million people who travel across time zones and they expect their internal clocks to adjust as rapidly as possible as they, as they do this. One of the things that we, we do to try to cope with this is many people take sleeping pills to try to uh, help them sleep at a time that their brain is trying to keep them awake. And of course, many, many people throughout the world uh, drink coffee or other caffeinated beverages to try to help them to stay awake during times that they haven't gotten enough sleep. In fact, coffee beans are the second most widely tra traded commodity in the world, second only to oil. And caffeine is by far the most widely used drug in the world. Uh, in fact, there, there are many new companies that have developed specialty coffees that increase tremendously the amount of caffeine per cup. So many, many people in this country and in many other countries in the world are chugging down massive amounts of caffeine in order to try to make up for this huge sleep debt uh, that is impairing performance and impairing the ability to stay awake. If you've been sleeping, for example, six hours a night for a week, your performance is already impaired by the same amount as if you've been awake for 24 consecutive hours. Now, one of the things that makes it challenging to sleep in the space environment is that when astronauts are aboard the International Space Station or the Space Shuttle, when they're in low Earth orbit, the sun is rising and setting every 90 minutes. They have about 45 minutes of light and 45 minutes of darkness. If you lose enough sleep, and astronauts typically lose about two hours of sleep per night when they're in space, you begin to build up this chronic fatigue that makes it difficult to perform. The next important factor that affects our ability to perform and sustain our alertness is a phenomenon called sleep inertia. 
essentially, if we have just woken from sleep, it takes time for the brain to fully wake up. Uh, the brain doesn't go from zero to 60 in seven seconds. Uh, and so there is a period of time of transition. And during that period of time of transition, in the first few minutes after awakening, our performance is very, very degraded. In fact, it's five standard deviations below the mean of our waking performance. It's more degraded than if we had been awake for 30 or 40 consecutive hours. And so that's why for people who say, you know, I can't function in the first few minutes after I get up until I take a shower and have a cup of coffee, it's, they're telling the truth. The brain takes time to make that transition. And, you know, we should never, for example, slip from the, the sleeper bunk on a truck to behind the driver's seat and immediately begin to drive because we're at much greater risk of having a sleep-related accident in those first few minutes of awakening. I also want to talk about a couple of other issues that are particularly relevant, uh, especially to, to teachers of children in our school system because sleep, one of the mo most important functions of sleep is for learning. Uh, and this has only been recently discovered in the past five to 10 years, the, in, the important role that sleep has in learning. Uh, and, and not only is it important that we sleep before we go to school and learn the information so that we can stay awake during class, but what has only recently been learned it, is that it is the sleep that we get after we go home that night that allows us to consolidate the memory. In fact, even practicing things like the piano, uh, if, you, if you practice a piece on the piano and then go to sleep that night, your performance will actually improve without any further practice during the night while you sleep. If you don't sleep during the night, that improvement does not happen. So the sleep that we get at night is critical for learning, and that's why it's so important uh, that children and adolescents understand the importance of sleep for not only their performance during the daytime, but also their learning. And the average middle school and, and high school student needs about nine to 10 hours of sleep per night. And the younger children need even more than that in order to sustain their alertness and performance. Finally, uh, one, of the, one of the most important safety messages to get across is the importance of sleep to our ability to sustain attention while driving. 80,000 people a day in the United States fall asleep at the wheel. Half of them drift into another lane or onto a rumble strip, and 10% run completely off of the road. In fact, there have been 250,000 drowsy driving crashes every year for the past five years. That's a drowsy driving crash once every two minutes. Fatal to the driver truck crashes are most commonly caused by fatigue. In fact, fatigue equals alcohol and drug-related fatal to the driver truck crashes combined. So it's a very important problem uh, that, that is largely unrecognized. The U.S. government spends $300 million a year educating us about the perils of alcohol and driving, which are very serious and very real. But we only spend one-tenth of one percent of that amount educating people about the importance of remaining alert when we drive and the dangers associated with drowsy driving. In fact, drowsy driving crashes account for 20% of all serious injuries in motor vehicle crashes. That's one out of five serious injuries and one out of five deaths, which is about 8,000 deaths a year on the nation's highways. Young people are the most vulnerable to these drowsy driving crashes. Two thirds of these drowsy driving crashes happen in people in their teens and 20s. And very few of them, only about 5%, happen to people over 65 years of age. That's be because the sleep-generating processes are strongest when we're young. We know that young children, you, it's, it's tough to even wake them up once they're asleep. Uh, and they seem to be able to sleep through anything. That's because the drive for sleep is so strong in young people. And that makes it particularly dangerous for young people to try to stay awake at night and attempt to drive at night. And that's why there's such an epidemic worldwide of drowsy driving crashes in young people. So I hope that this material has helped all, I hope that this material has helped clarify the factors that affect our ability to sustain alertness and performance during the daytime and will enable all of us to get a good night's sleep.
Thank you.